Thank you, everybody. And again, we just want to get you warmed up and thinking about this work. And a lot of you are doing this. I mean, what the amazing thing is about this gathering is that in the last few years, topics like racial equity and equity and community engagement have gained, gained a lot more currency within the collective impact world and have become topics that we keep coming back to. And yesterday, there was a wonderful session that First Five LA put on. I don't think I've ever seen others, including myself, take that many notes in a session before in terms of the great work they've done addressing some of these issues around community engagement. Um, last, uh, a few months ago, I published a piece called uh, Community Engagement, Engagement Matters Now More Than Ever with Melody Barnes from the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions. And um, a couple of the people we talked about are in the room, Rebecca Box and the folks in Providence, and LaShonda Vernon from the United Way in Milwaukee, who will be up here in a moment. But a couple of things that we really looked at when we looked at why it's so important for people to do this and what they have to pay attention to was we talked about the, the importance first of just, it has to be something you see as necessary to your result, not something that's nice to do. That when you're checking a box called community engagement, you will fail. When you see that without engaging the community, you cannot achieve the transformative change in your community, that's when you realize it's something you have to do. And we have to get to a point where we recognize that it's something that's necessary, not just nice. We have to bring a sense of what we call patient urgency to it. Um, that the challenge with, with, with engagement so often is we get in this place about how much and how much time and how, and, and we have to kind of, that what we talked about is the tension is something you hold. That if, 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 is that if you spend, if you get too patient, you can get ground down in process. And if you push too hard to action, you lose all that engagement. And that it's right that there should be some kind of push and pull that you're constantly kind of holding as a leader. And, and we call that patient urgency. It's making sure you're still moving forward and moving towards your results and goals, but that you're creating that space continually and kind of pushing yourself to make sure you're engaging as much as possible as you do. And we talked about the difference between ownership and buy-in, that often engagement begins with, oh, let's get input from the community. And we only think of the community in terms of like giving us feedback or input, but we don't think of the community as producers of outcomes. That we don't recognize that people, that if we're trying to solve problems in communities, it's family, friends, and neighbors often who are going to create that change for each other. And that we th only think of them as people we can listen to, not people who actually are producers of outcomes and results and partners and assets in our effort to do that. And that when we think of them that way, that's how we move from just wanting their buy-in on a process to really wanting them to own and participate in the process. And, and, and finally, we talked about the importance of local relationships and recognizing, and this came up in First 5 LA's session yesterday, that just because an organization is in a neighborhood, that doesn't mean the leader of that organization is a neighborhood leader. That we have to really assess who has relationships in the neighborhood. Who really, and, and really recognize that when we're doing work in communities, we have to build relationships with those who have the relationships, not just those who are in the community, but who really have the deeper relationships in the community, really put those first. And so we're implementing initiatives We've got to look at who has the relationships, not just who has the big capacity. And so those are some of the things that we came up with, and, and I want to share just to kind of frame some of the thinking. But we've got a really exciting and interesting panel to kind of share some ideas. And we've invited each of them to come up and share some of their perspective of what they've been learning about community engagement. And then we'll have engagement with the audience again after they each share some comments. And the three of them are, starting with Akila Butler, the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Um, who leads their community change portfolio, uh, which involves almost every federal program I've heard of. Um, and you can have a seat in one of the chairs. And Akilah's with um, uh, including the, the Choice Neighborhoods, Promise Neighborhoods, and the Building Neighborhood Capacity. We have Celi Savusa here from Seattle. She's uh, the executive director of the White Center Community Development Association and a longtime community resident and advocate in that community. Welcome, Celi. And then we have LaShonda Vernon, who until very recently was the executive director of the Life Course Initiative for Healthy Families in Milwaukee, which was an infant mortality initiative funded by the Wisconsin Partnership Program and led by the United Way of Greater Milwaukee. And she, as of I think next week, becomes the executive director of an organization called Walnut Way, which is a neighborhood development organization. Um, and all three of them have done a lot of work in this area. And so what we'd like to do is just start off and invite each of them to share some reflections on what does community engagement mean to you and what have you seen in terms of what really works 
and what doesn't? Mm -hmm. And what have you learned? So Akilah, we'll begin with you. Sure. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, and I'm happy to be here um, this afternoon. <coughs> so um, thank you, Paul, for that, um, I think, provocative question about community engagement and what works. And um, I have had the pleasure to be involved with four um, national and local um, place-based initiatives, um, probably spanning about 20 years of work. And what I have seen work and what I most importantly have seen not work is a couple things. Um, and I'm talking to a room full of funders for the most part. Um, and I was a funder of um, two place-based initiatives. Um, and things that have worked is going into the community and being honest that the community doesn't trust me. Um, the community doesn't know my intentions. Um, I went in as a funder into, in, a, in a community and I wasn't even sure about our own intentions past wanting to get, um, be involved or have community engagement. Um, and so I had to be honest about that going in. And so what um, I did to help kind of quell uh, mistrust because there, I had to be honest that there was a history of mistrust between power brokers and people who lived in a community. And I had to understand what power meant and power, the ability to define your own reality and more importantly, have people then live in it, right? And for the communities we were entering, people didn't have that ability to define their own reality. So one of the things that I did when I was working with the Annie E. Casey Foundation um, in Atlanta, um, when we were doing the Atlanta Civic Site, was we actually went into the community and gave the community money to do local grant making. So the community was able to set up local resident boards. They designed it. Um, and then they were able to then dis um, come up with criteria as to how to give out money to their fellow neighbors. Um, and then they gave small grants out. Now why this was important was because we said explicitly and implicitly to the community that we trust you with resources. That we don't wanna just come to your community and extract your lived experience, um, but rather we, wanna, we want to offer you an, um, our trust um, in your ability to make good decisions. So we came, and it, and it wasn't a huge investment. I mean, we may have put about $150,000, $200,000 on the street um, in, in, you know, in a local community in Atlanta, but actually allowing residents to um, do many grants to their neighbors went a long way to building trust. Um, so I think that worked. And I think the other thing that worked is knowing that it takes a long time to build community. Mm -hmm. um, that you don't, you know, and, and I don't know about you all, but you know, as a funder, you have, um, I worked at a community foundation too, so you had donors you had to appease, you had your CEO, um, you had your board, everybody wants to see indicators and everybody wants to see them in a 12 month cycle. And we, I had to constantly be in communication with uh, my, um, with our CEO and with our board about um, building community and trust and rapport takes time. And it's not gonna happen in a, in a grant cycle. And it took people a long time to understand that, but then I also had to come up with measures that we could point to to say, wow, we are making progress. Because I can't just keep telling people it's gonna take time. They need to actually see some progress, a trend. So that was a, that was a tension. Um, but anyway, I mean, those are some of the things um, that I've seen um, work um, in community. But I'll stop there. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what are some um, things you've seen work and not work in terms of, of community engagement work? Um, so, hi everybody. Yeah, I love to be in front of funders and because there's so many things I want to say to you and <laughs> um, there is uh, the first question on the, the little uh, activity that you did. I looked at these two and I said, yeah, we got some masters in here who know how to mess stuff up. <laughs> and, um, but I'm saying that because you understand how you are being talked about when you are in community right. because money is so disorganizing. Mm. And um, you, you know, part, some of it is very simple. Quit talking so much. You know, let the community find their voice in a process 
But I think what's even more powerful, if you can go in and find out what the priorities are of this community that you want to impact. So White Center has, was one of the Making Connection sites, Casey Foundation, a 10-year commitment to White Center. Mm -hmm. They brought their stuff, their charts, and you know we as a community said, okay, how does that relate to our, ch our charts? <laughs> But you know, it took a while for them to understand, we agree, we don't disagree with what you're trying to do, but how does that relate to what our priorities are? And it's that conversation that I think we kind of jumped the gun because we're really anxious to get community voice involved and get, get community participants and talk to the young people. But have you, you know, did somebody ask the question, what is it that is important for this community? And so, um, it, you know, that's a basic question. Mm -hmm. And funders come and go, but I, you know, when you come to White Center, I want your behavior to change as a funder when you're done. And that w the next community that you go to, you will at least learn something from our experience together um, that you know, many communities do not take lightly. Mm -hmm. And so, it's personal, the way you come into communities with your money and with your outcomes and indicators and research, you know, it's very personal to us. And, but, you know, I'm not saying this to be critical, I'm saying this to speak truth mm -hmm. because we don't have time, we don't have and we make the time to have the kind of conversations that really get to some of this nonsense that we do to communities. Mm -hmm. And so the gentleman made a comment about, you know, um, making sure that uh, there's information accessible for various languages. That's the last thing y'all think about sometimes. And usually it's, you know, we throw a little pot of money, but you know, interpretation and translation, it costs real money. It does. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, figure it out. As a community organizer, I have a high tolerance for chaos. I can mm -hmm. handle the frustration that the community has. Mm -hmm. I can also handle the frustration that funder has as long as you're honest mm -hmm. with how you will exist in our neighborhood. And so, um, you know, helping residents and community folks find their voice, ensuring that young people are part of the mix, um, I think will, will take you far. And so I'll let you go. So in my community engagement journey, I think talent, place, and relationships matter the most. And they can be the thing that takes you in the wrong direction or exactly in the right direction, but you have to pay attention to those pillars. So I'm gonna take a few steps back on my own personal servant leadership journey um, and just kind of tie together my relationship with Paul. I was a public ally a long time ago. And um, as a public ally, I didn't know my talents. I didn't know my capabilities. Um, and I didn't know some of the things that I was well positioned to do as a professional. Um, but I'm third generation Milwaukeean. And one of the important aspects of placemaking, of relationship building, is that every neighborhood, every set of blocks has a history. And when you come in as a new participant in that neighborhood, you have to understand that history or you have to find someone with the talent necessary mm -hmm. to translate that history to you. Um, and so I think it's really important that as funders, you become hybrids. What United Way did that was very important is they sought out talent specific to what they needed to do around the birth outcomes for black babies. They couldn't just come in and say, we're going to fix this problem for black people because that's the opposite of doing equity work. Right. So they sought out talent, you know, and I'm not tooting my own horn, but some of my talent comes from having a grandmother and a mother who were matriarchs in community issues, right. who were leaders in educational attainment in neighborhoods, who if you walk those blocks, my grandmother was one of the grandmothers that would be sitting in the window watching to see who is in my neighborhood so I can tell someone 
that these people were here, describe them, explain what they were doing, all those things, right? Just like a black watch as foundations, you need people to translate to that watch person, whether it's a grandmother or grandfather, to be able to tell you what's not okay in your neighborhood. Because when we talk about power dynamic, you will not be able to outdo the power that comes from grandma. Right. Doesn't matter right. how much money right. you throw at the issue, doesn't matter how many layers of titles and acronyms behind your name, grandma outweighs you. And right. she will shut you down and you won't even know she did it. <laughs> so that is the learning that, that, that United Way in Milwaukee has had, hiring the talent that is from this community, yep. that has this intrinsic knowledge of who not to piss off. Yeah. And that in and of itself is your first step before That's you go right. in on an That's issue right. that you heard through the data, through the statistics, through the zip codes. We can talk about zip codes forever. Right. Because if you walk into those zip codes and you think there's poverty, many of those people don't think that they're poor. They think that this is the life that they live, they take care of each other, and they are rich amongst each other, despite what data has said to all of you. So. That's the learning, I heard snaps, I've been wanting to snap for a couple days. Um, <laughs> but that's the learning that I have around community engagement. It's really important that you do that neighborhood relationship building. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that talent, hire someone who does. Yep. So each of you brought up the term power. <laughs> and one of the things that comes up a lot in, in when we start doing community engagement is a lot of these efforts and funders, whether they be municipal or, or private philanthropy or corporate philanthropy, um, and you start having tables that have community members mm -hmm. and you have institutional leaders. Um, how do you mitigate or work with, through the power dynamics that often happen at those tables so you can have greater equity and get to, like, what are some things you've seen or you'd recommend for how to kind of mitigate some of that? Um. Sure, I can, I can definitely go. So some of my recommendations um, are this. One is that I am a proponent of paying residents for their time that they contribute to the process. Um, this is, well, we could talk about this all day, but <laughs> we, we have run into some issues with um, some of my funding colleagues, but um, I believe in paying them and paying them a fair wage. Um, for them to sit at the table and make meetings, providing mm -hmm. transportation, providing daycare services so they can be at the meetings and know that their children are fine. I mean, that's at the basic level. I think the other thing that I would recommend or and have seen, all these things that I'm recommended, recommending are processes I've actually implemented. So I can talk to you more about the nuances if people have questions. Um, it's really also about training of both the actual power brokers at the table, but also mm -hmm. the residents that come to the table. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had to um, change our framework around who's actually leading the process of community change work. Um, I think in the beginning, um, we were all like, we wanna be resident led, mm -hmm. um, but we, got, we were getting some pushback. Um, because a lot of our place-based initiatives are larger than a neighborhood and they involve city level um, stakeholders and philanthropic stakeholders. And so they wanted the community voice at the table, but they didn't want to be alienated, alienated from the, um, for how decisions were being made. Mm -hmm. So we had to come up with a fair and equitable way of how we made decisions um, around the table. And so how we did that was by training people, how do you sit there in, in, in a place with people you perceive as being less power, powerless than you? I mean, that you perceive as being powerless than you because funders, including myself, we had to admit how we actually perceived the community, how we perceived as coming in and saving them, how we perceived as having all the resources. Um, and we also had to train the community, um, you know, because a lot of them felt you know, didn't necessarily have the efficacy to, to feel like they can mm. sit at a table and push back on things. Um, do we all call each other by our first names, last names, titles? Mm -hmm. If you introduce young people to the table, I've, you know, I've been a youth organizer for many years before mm -hmm. I went um, into the establishment. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, how do you prepare young people to sit at the table and not mm -hmm. be tokenized but be a real voice? Mm -hmm. So we, we did spend, we did it simultaneously, so we provided training to the various segments that sat at the table, and as the foundation, we were able to pay for that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think the other thing, and this is a really tough thing, is around, we've been talking a lot about results here, and we have struggled a, a lot, not about coming to the table and everybody like agreeing or pushing a particular result, but actually setting what the results are. Mm. That's where the challenge has been because as much as I want to believe everybody's coming there to improve the community, people have self-interest. And so um, the challenge has been, how do you bring people to a table that have multiple self-interests, even though you want to amplify like, the goal that we're all here to do and improve the community? We have struggled around, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Foundations, you know, um, I used to get into it all the time um, with my philanthropic partners because they were getting mandates from their foundations to basically yeah. get the community yeah. to sign on to what they've already decided in their in their foundation offices rather than to have an authentic community process where the end goal was being created in real time with the community right mm -hmm. so you have to think about what your what you want when you talk about we want to engage the community in an authentic process mm -hmm. are you trying to mm -hmm. sell them or mm -hmm. are you actually trying to engage them in a process where you guys come up with a set of results to work on mm -hmm. and what i was finding out was that um, and it's no fault, the program officers aren't bad, they aren't horrible people. I wasn't a bad or horrible person. The challenge was that our purse strings or you know, professional strings were being pulled by people that never set foot in the community, right? So things were being decided in, you know, in, in cities where the foundation headquarters were, and mm -hmm. then they expected the program office to implement, implement those initiatives in communities. And you know, you know how this goes as you work with, you know, that we ain't gonna say. But you know, that has been part of the challenge. And, um, and we struggled a lot around that because the community members, I remember a community member saying, look, what we want in our community is banks. We want supermarkets, right? Mm -hmm. And the foundation pushing back and saying, no, we want like an employment center. Because they've actually developed this kind of strategy, but didn't let the community know that that's what they were working toward. Mm -hmm. So they were doing community visioning and trying to kind of sway the community mm -hmm. and facilitate conversations. Mm -hmm. But the community was like, no, we want what regular communities have. Mm -hmm. So I think if you want to embark on this process or you're firmly steeped in it, it's about being honest about, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, what your agenda is, you know. Um, and really, you, you have to be honest because if not, you will sabotage the um, you will sabotage the process because people feel mm -hmm. like okay, yeah, this isn't authentic. You mm -hmm. guys came here to sell me as opposed to really um, develop a process in real time. The other thing that I want to add really quickly is balance. Mm -hmm. So typically, what funders tend to do is to have you know a lot of foundation staff or you know institutional staff, and then to community people. Mm. Wrong. Mm. <laughs> you know, community has to have as many seats at the table as uh, as funders do. Mm. So here in Seattle, uh, my organization, my community, is part of Communities of Opportunity, which is actually a partnership between Seattle Foundation and King County local government. And in the development of that, um, they had community partners who helped to come in and help create the structure for this work to happen. Now, that's pretty unheard of to have community folks to come in and have um, really lend their voice mm -hmm. around the structure. Mm -hmm. The thing that was amazing was that we knew um, we have to get our partners, the foundation, Seattle Foundation and the county, to think about, you know, do you believe in these communities? Yeah. So, sometimes it's not even about money to get to the right place initially. I want you to believe in my community. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in the families that work there regardless of the situation, regardless of the poverty, um, regardless of the diversity? I, if you don't believe in the, these families and these communities that you're mm -hmm. about to work with, then your work is meaningless. And if people from the communities that we are serving, we propose to serve, are not at the table in a real way, mm -hmm. you know, you're only there for you as the foundation. And so we have to get to the relational piece of, the, the, of our uh, re of residents 
and funders and institutional partners, we have to get to the place where you see me as your friend. You know, we have, in the communities of opportunity, there's people that still drive me fucking crazy. <laughs> but I'm not gonna go anywhere. I gotta get this person to understand mm -hmm. you're dealing with people's lives. That's right. That the impact that I want you to have, I want White Center to, people in White Center to stand taller because you were involved. That, you know, you can't put a price on that. And I don't, you know, I don't need you there to dictate how, you know, how sorry conditions are. Mm. I need you there to continue to tell this community they're worth every struggle that they're going through. And we're gonna figure out how we can best support by getting out of the way, <laughs> by listening to what people are telling you, and by finding the right resources to bring to the table. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's the, that's the first and foremost that I usually ask of funders who are gonna work with us, you gotta believe in these folks. Cause we will whoop your ass <laughs> if you step out of line. Because the power is in this community. Mm -hmm. and we even have to, you know, we're amidst many meetings with funders and institutional partners, and I am sitting there thinking, oh shit. <laughs> Where's my people? <laughs> because we need to figure, you know, we gotta know who is being real in this work. Mm -hmm. And who are the allies within the systems and the funders that really can hear me mm -hmm. in a real way as a friend to, the, to our community. And so, this is the kind of conversations we don't have. Mm -hmm. I'd say this over and over and over. And I, you know, and Kirsten and you know, Cheryl are there from Kelly, and I'm all, you know, and Kirsten, a lot of time I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but it, because she respects the community, she respects the work, she will listen. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We mess up too, mm -hmm. as people of color and communities. Mm -hmm. We don't yeah. have all the answers, mm -hmm. That's right. but if you're gonna be real about being here, then make sure that we're a partner that really, um, that you, that is a partnership like a, like a true friend. And so I wanna give a, a bit of a tangible example from the land of public health. So for those of you that are, are funding in health, um, one of the things that is the bane of my existence is stipends for focus groups. And let me explain to you why this is the bane of my existence. When you stipend people, now I've been through several funding relationships where stipends were the norm. And then I'm the person investigating the issue and those individuals are coming to me knowing that when they complete a survey, I will give them $50. So let's start with that expectation being set up. So now you're engaging community by having me do surveys and then those surveys are done and then this could be mom who's trying to buy diapers for her kids. So intentions are pure. But what eventually happens is you create a culture of stipend seeking in communities of poverty where every three to five years that money runs out and now they have to reposition themselves for whatever you fund next. Why is this bad? Because what you should be doing is taking the people you stipend, developing their capacity to do work, and then finding and helping them connect to sustainable jobs. And if you wanna do equity work, we talked about equity from the top. This is the center of how you can do equity work. When you're evaluating, teach the people you're measuring how to measure themselves. That's right. Bring your evaluation to those communities instead of having evaluators that sit somewhere else yeah. who never engage directly with the people and just collect information from your staffs or whatever partner organizations, whoever the program manager, director, et cetera, is responsible for that because I, for many years when I was in direct service, would get the phone calls from the person from a grant that's over who can't buy diapers. I'm fielding all those calls for families who were counting on my $50 every month. Right. And we are being irresponsible in communities where there is poverty. If that focus group approach is what we use, 
We also, now this is me as a woman of color being one of the few women of color in a room where you're reporting on your focus groups. And that frustrates me. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sitting here listening to you talk about how poor people are, how miserable they are, their lives are falling apart, everything is terrible. But if you're in the culture of seeking those stipends, you will say whatever you need to say for your $50. And people will start saying, my life is terrible and it's going down the tubes, because they know at the end of this, you're gonna present it to somebody and they could care less what you say to them. Just give me my $50. So now look at the message you've spread across a group of people who haven't engaged with anyone in this community of poverty that prescribed by statement, I'm not assuming, because poverty is relative. But you told this group of people who've never met anybody in my neighborhood that all the fathers, for example, are just so broke down and beaten and they can't get a job and their lives are terrible. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally talking about quotes that we will put up on a PowerPoint presentation at the end of grants. And this is why you need to give us more money, right? Be careful with the stipends because it creates a culture of seeking. And they'll seek that more than they'll seek gainful employment because they know you're gonna be back yeah. every three years, yeah. right? So be really, really careful with how you use some of those systems because they have literally been what has created some of the inequity in neighborhoods and communities. Yep. So thank you. And what I'd like to do is open it up to see if we have any questions from the audience. Ideas or examples. We don't I see a hand back here. I do this thing. <laughs> the lights are bright here. Is this on? It's it on. is now. Um, <laughs> I work for a anti-poverty, anti-racism agency here in Seattle, King County, and we use a couple tools to help us uh, decide if the actions that we're doing have unintended consequences. Are there tools that you use um, and that you can recommend, or systems and infrastructure that you can recommend to help uh, the people in this room think about those types of things, or given the example that you just gave, what would you suggest so as an alternative? I would suggest, first and foremost, uh, when it comes to, when you look at the, the five elements of collective impact, being a trusted agency, you're not gonna be that. Be okay with that. But identify an organization that will develop the people that come to that organization to be the next levels of leaders, the next employable group in the community, and let them attract the people. Instead of siphoning off attracting the people into focus groups, and I know that's an easy win for a lot of people. So it's like, we can do this, we can hire a consultant, they can do the focus groups, they can write us a report. But you won't have the right impact. You won't have the right engagement. And that consultant does not have that community's trust. They have $50 per survey. And so you will get people to show up, but it'll be the wrong people. And I've got some good examples of that. Sometimes it would be people who really were just searching for stipends. They knew who all got the grants from the funder too. I mean, it's not hard to find out who got the grants. But the key here is if you start with one of those neighborhood-based organizations where people are going anyway, they're gonna be there because this is a place that they trust, whether it's their children are there because it's a youth program, whether it's a health systems support organization that helps them navigate their health care and they already trust someone there as their case manager. But whatever the case is, the work needs to go a little deeper into a trust organization as opposed to just kind of getting knowledge so you can make a decision, if that makes sense. Thank you. Or, or, um... Um, I don't think I have much to add on this. Um, I think you did a great job of identifying a trusted local organization. Um, I think that any grant making you do, you have to do a continuous quality um, you know, assessment of that to make sure you're not hurting people that you claim to help. Um, even with the stipend uh, piece that I raised as a best practice, um, um, or paying residents um, to be part of you know, your work group or your advisory group as a best practice, you know, we have to think about are we then um, raising their income so much that they're not able to now get the necessary um, kind of resources that they need, you know, um, because now it's counted as income, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was a challenge. That's why I said I could talk to you about the nuances of what that looks like, mm -hmm. um, but we had to struggle with that. We don't wanna mess up anybody's social security 
as we're paying elderly residents to be part of the group. Young people is not such a huge problem, but for mothers that have certain um, benefits, we don't want to jeopardize those by giving them dollars, but we want to show them that they have value in the process. Um, and I don't know if anybody in here has read $2 a day that talks about just the level of non-cash that um, many um, folks in, in neighborhoods experience because of TANF and, and how it is no longer meeting people's needs. Um, cash now becomes a real big issue. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you give them, um, whether it's a pay or a stipend, you know, now they have to engage with a local financial institution, right? And so um, that's another kind of hurdle for many, for many residents. Again, I could talk to you about how we've been able to do that. But I, I think more importantly, you asked for models. Um, and I think part of it, it is connecting with a local organization that can help you do constant quality um, improvements mm -hmm. to whatever interventions you put forth in communities. Mm -hmm. So you do not hurt people that you want to help. Another question? We've got Hello. one over here and one over, where, where are we? Okay, there Hi. we are. Hi. <laughs> how you doing? Good, how are um, you? Great discussion. I have a question about how you build capacity, uh, how, how you've approached building capacity in communities where mm -hmm. um, they're not, there's not consensus among the community about what they want. Mm -hmm. So you've engaged them very authentically, but different members have very varying opinions about what the priority should or should mm -hmm. not be. Mm -hmm. So in White Center, um, White Center is about 14,000 residents. There's like two worlds in White Center. There's a more affluent part, uh, property owners, mostly white. And then there's um, White Center of North Highland, which is a um, high immigrant refugee population, uh, very diverse, mostly poor families. And so I know as the executive director of an organization that really is trying to make sure that all voices count, it's building the relationships with like mm -hmm. the chamber folks, um, folks in the neighboring councils, like Burien is right next to White Center. Mm -hmm. um, the businesses, many of the bus some of the white business owners making sure that we're connected to them or staff is. And then, you know, 80% of the White Center CDA staff live there in White Center. I live there. I could throw mm -hmm. a rock at them mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's different when you have people who live there, work there, and connect. And, um, and it actually validates the work that you're doing on behalf of the organization um, because they know you live there. We see you. And so, um, again, it, it's all about the relationships that you're able to establish. It's all about taking a risk because it's uncomfortable going into other communities. Um, but you also have to be humble enough to listen mm -hmm. to the different voices um, and be able to learn. And, you know, I always tell folks, you know, I, I know it may not seem that way, but it's not all about me. Mm -hmm. It's about how do I create the space for staff, for residents, mm -hmm. for our funders, for institutional partners mm -hmm. to come in and help us figure this out. How do I get to the place where everybody's working together and connecting to talk to each other, but figure this out? And you know, Seattle here, I don't know if you're from here, but you know, I, we are using equity, this is like Equityville, for those of you from out of town. <laughs> and you know, our local government King County government has an inequity initiative, a race and social justice initiative, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what? It, it's even, it can be really powerful if we all get together and get on the same page about what equity really means. Mm -hmm. And so that means authentic relationships, mm -hmm. um, uh, struggling uh, with each other. <laughs> Um, because we do a lot of, you know, meeting after the meeting, then we talk, mm -hmm. talk shit about you guys. <laughs> but get to the place, get to the place where we can have the conversation. I know I can have conversations with folks in public health and, and mm -hmm. local government and council members, but I can also have the conversation with folks at Gates and tell them, okay, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes we have to be checked, not only funders, but us too. Mm -hmm. right. And 
this, you know, nobody's trying to play got you because the work is too important. Mm -hmm. This is really about how do we get to a place where you understand how critical your role is. I need you yeah. to be in the community. I know you need us, but I need you too. But you have to be there in a way that understands the leaders live here, that the power is in the communities that's being served. That's where the power is. Don't confuse that at all. But let's figure out, you know, but I'm also really want to elevate the importance of the respect that we have for the people who are working on behalf of our communities. And we're, that gives us hope mm -hmm. to do this work. Mm -hmm. So I just want, and I think um, I want to also answer your question too about capacity building um, because it's apparently where I'm spending my, doing my life's work at these days. Um, so I think a couple things. One is that I, you know, I think it's okay for people in the community not to agree, right, right on what the priorities are. I mean, there's a lot of pri there's a lot of competing priorities. I'm the mother of three small children. Okay, I have two that haven't even entered kindergarten yet. My major priority is childcare. I don't care what <laughs> anybody else is talking about, it's childcare, right? right? So there are developmental um, pushes on people. Um, you know, people have certain sensibilities. It's okay. I think one thing we have to remember is that we are not God as funders. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is connect people in the community to resources. Mm -hmm. So if you know that there is a local um, or city level committee that, uh, that could serve the needs of residents better, connect them, right? Mm -hmm. Connect them. Now, if there's a gap there, if there's no, you know, I mean, a part of me feels like, look, people's needs are gonna f fall in like maybe five to seven categories. And hopefully there is a city level or county level work group committee advisory group that they can join to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And your job could be how do you help prepare them to sit there in a place of power when they're sitting on those groups. Right. You as a funder don't have to take care of every need of right. every person in a community. Mm -hmm. That is, that is, that's too much. Yeah. But what you can do is create pathways for them to get connected because at the end of the day, you're going to lead. And we want to create communities that are stronger, so we want to connect them um, outside of their community, because that's part of the, the reason why communities are in the conditions that they're in, because they're isolated. And we want to make sure people can come out of those communities and connect to larger resources. But I also think there is a human capital issue, too. Um, and The Economist is going to just come roaring out of me now, um, and I apologize. <laughs> but part of this work, it, part of this work, and, and Celia, you were hitting on it, is all, it's a spiritual component too. And I have been working in community since I've been 14 years old. And I know that part of my job is to be a mentor to people, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, I come in and I have organizational kind of power and dollars behind me. But my job sometimes is to just do a living room meeting and talk to folks. They're like, man, I always wanted to do this. How do I do? And maybe connect them to a local community college so they can build their individual mm -hmm. capacity, because that's what you said. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure if we can help anybody read, write, think better, you know, so they can go into the labor market and be more competitive. That's 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 the real work right there. I'm be honest Absolutely. with you. So I don't want to artificially give somebody an opportunity that you know they're going to fail at. But you want to all build their capacity along the way so they can be competitive. You don't want to come in as a funder, you know, promise people the moon and stars and then leave after three to five years because priorities change, leadership and foundations change. You leave and go right. on and move in your own career. You, so I, had, I do think there has to be a strong human capital component to any kind of place-based work that you do. How do you make sure the people are better? Mm -hmm. And whether that is connection to, you know, training programs or oh, a local welding, you know, group or a community college that wants to now make sure people can take certifications and training mm -hmm. or a GED program. Mm -hmm. Those things are fabulous because they exist even when the money is gone. People are better mm -hmm. as a result of those type of human capital right. um, interventions. Right. So I shameless plug. <laughs> Public allies of which I'm alumni, was one of our ways to invest in people's capacity in Milwaukee. And so when we started the initiative and became the backbone agency for Life Course Initiative, everyone said, well, how are you going to get the community voice involved? Where are you going to get the community? So we prescribed zip codes that we chose public allies from. 
And I think that what really was great, we didn't know what we were gonna get out of that. That was what I called my calculated risk. We took five. Five from the zip codes identified with the highest infant mortality rates, which also happened to have the highest murder rates, the highest any other bad rate you can think of, because they're all the same zip codes in Milwaukee. Right. And we hired five people from those neighborhoods. And those five young people showed us talents we never knew we could use in the work we did. So we had a communications person. She ended up doing video for all things across the United Way spectrum. We, I kept having to find her. Can I please have <laughs> our public ally back? Um, so there's this talent that you will unearth through a tactic like identifying public allies. And if you've got a public allies office in your community, just simply work directly with them to identify, I need them to be from the place-based issue area. Right that we've chosen, and then you'll get some of that community talent that is rough, that you can then help to develop. And then what ends up happening with the five of the, the allies is that's gainful employment, that's a collective impact approach to shared funding because half of that comes from federal dollars. They get stipends for college, and they can do up to three years to, with a stipend included. And so we kept ours for two years. We, we invested in the five of them for two years. And that was an opportunity that some people take, but a lot of times what, what people in the foundation world would do, I'm so sorry if this is going to be rude, but we tend to look for this higher level public ally who's a little bit more seasoned and more experienced and et cetera. Take the talent from the neighborhoods that you're targeting. Mm -hmm. Work with them. It's gonna be more work, I promise. It was more work. <laughs> but it was worth it because I was an ally. Mm -hmm. And now look where I am today because people invested in me. So look at it from that perspective. If someone hadn't invested in you, I don't care what your position is in status, right. if someone hadn't invested in you, you wouldn't be where you are today. That's right. So if we really believe in the neighborhoods that we are prioritizing and not targeting, prioritizing and not targeting, we will make sure that we help those young people to develop so that we're going downstream a little bit further and getting them ready to be the next level of leaders for changing their neighborhood. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank all three of you, uh, LaShondra and Celie and, and Akila for sharing all that perspective. And I think, you know, really the key lesson is really around how are we investing. Community engagement is not something you do on the cheap and make shortcuts and do fast. It's an investment in the community. It's an investment often in the human capital of community. It's investment in relationship building and people and in the development process. And so I hope as you go back, you continue to pursue this work. 